I'm excited for today. Um, Nick and I drove to St. Louis last night, which is supposed to be about a three hour, 45 minute drive. We saw Pearl Jam. We got home. I went to bed at like three. So I'm here though. I'm here with bells and whistles on whatever that saying means. Um, I'm excited to be here. And today I want to talk about how the Duke of Tone and how the Timmy pedals are a big deal. Um, why they're a big deal and why I think this is a monumental moment in pedals. And I want to answer some questions today. I want to try to find time. I'm going to go through this more quickly than I did in something like last week. Plus it's, it's not as heavy as a topic as some of the, the deeper stuff, but I want to go through some notes and, uh, we will do some time for Q and A. All right. First time watching evil Grusler. Glad you're on here. Um, Harold Corey is on YouTube with a fire stick. Awesome. The lighting makes me look pale. Let me let me explain. I am pale. Let me back it off though. Still pale. See, it doesn't matter if I get. No, I'm really pale. But I'm always pale. All right, let's jump into this. How the MXR Duke of Tone. And Timmy pedals are a big deal. And I want to answer questions about them. There's a lot of questions. Are they good? Are they bad? And most of these questions are what I would consider surfacy. Um, people are worried if they sound right. So we'll get into it. Let's walk through it. Okay. So two of the most important and legendary boutique pedals in history have now been officially licensed for production with the designer's involvement. So I know Paul Cochran fairly well. Analog Mike, we've talked a few times. He's always been, like, we've had some great little chats and conversations. Mainly my talks with him have been, hey, I'm going to talk about the King of Tone and the Blues Breaker episode. Hey, I'm going to do this. And he's always very polite and very helpful. And they're both seem, they seem like they're both amazing people. Um, and the thing that's funny is they're very particular people. So their track record is extremely particular, um, meaning they are, they're, they're very much involved in the sound. I mean, Paul and Mike, I mean, Paul, I've seen more really obsesses over. It has to sound perfect. This isn't ready for release. Like his new Tim, he waited it out. He got it right. There's a real like level of excellence to both of these designers and builders. And we see this moment in history where both of these people are now officially licensed by MXR. Now, I think this is really important. It's important to recognize historical moments and kind of talk about them in, in the moment so that later on they're further understood and not missed. And a lot of the work I do, it's like finding cool stories like this, you know, who made these? Why did they make them? But I'm 30 years late and it's insanely hard. There are similar conversations and things that I'm trying to figure out from say the early seventies or mid seventies color sound era where they uh, private labeled or made pedals for tons of people and all of it's lost. So we have this beauty of the internet to take a moment, step back, view it and make videos like this and talk about it as a community so that the story is straight in the future. We have websites, we have information. Now, the reason I'm doing this, you might ask, well, yeah, there's a website. They said they released it and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a website, you know, buy this pedal, it sounds good, stuff like that. The legendary Tim or the legendary King of Tone. I like this idea because I like this approach and this idea of communicating with you and doing a Q&A and just getting the community talking about it because I think this is a pivotal historical thing and we can kind of cement it in. I liken it to, you know, you pour a new sidewalk at your house and like you have your kids come over and put their hand in it. Like you make it a permanent moment. And that's what I'm wanting to do today is kind of make this a uh, permanent moment that we all recognize, hey, this is bigger than, this is a bigger thing than does the Duke of Tones sound good or does the Timmy sound good? 
So to answer that, you've been, you know, baited in with a thumbnail. Is it good or bad? There's two questions here. Do they sound good or bad? And are they good or bad? Do they sound good or bad? They sound amazing. Paul Cochran's involved. Mike's involved. Period. Like, they sound great. So this is a really fascinating thing. These two legendary people, legendary boutique pedals that can be kind of hard to get, they are now suddenly mass produced by MXR, which is Dunlop. Now, if you didn't know, MXR is is under the umbrella of Dunlop. And I want to go through some of that history. So monumental on many levels. I'll move on from that thought now that we've framed that out. Jim Dunlop is, well, Jim Dunlop was a master. His son, Jimmy, is also a master of taking amazing creative things, amazing companies, amazing ideas, amazing brands, and collaborating with them in a way that benefits that company exponentially and the market of gear exponentially. So here's some things that he's done. So so Jim Dunlop is the original, in my opinion, I want to study this more. I actually want to interview Jimmy. Um, I've never met Jimmy, but I have very close friends who work with Jimmy. And I want to have so many things that they've done. And Jim was a master of what I'm about to show you. Here's the history of brands that MXR history brands that Dunlop has collaborated with. Okay, so this is important to understand the context of what we're seeing historically with these two pedals. Everybody with me? All right. In 1982, Jim Dunlop gets the trademark for Crybaby and starts and relaunches Crybaby Wah pedals. This alone is massive. The Crybaby Wah. It's like every kid wants a cry, but every kid wants a wah. Like I remember hearing Bulls on Parade and Voodoo Child, right? Those were the two wah songs. I wasn't ever really into Metallica and stuff, but like Metallica alone has sold a billion wahs. But I remember like Bulls on Parade, wow, wow, chicka, wow, wow. What is that? It's a wah pedal. I had to buy one immediately. And then obviously things like Voodoo Child. Now, Jim Dunlop, brought the wah back, the crybaby back, and made it an accessible, produced thing for the masses, for mass retail, like Guitar Center, that gets so overlooked that it's painful. The next thing he brings back in 1988 is MXR. MXR went bankrupt. They fell apart, and they no longer existed. So here in 2022, it's so easy to just be like mxr dynacomp man those script compressors are classic you know they made those back in 74 and there's never been anything like it but we glaze over generally the mass public uh glazes over the fact that mxr fell apart due to internal differences of what they should do as a company and keith Barr, the genius founder's interest in what they were making he was tired of phasers and compressors and got into digital. And then we see MXR kind of fall apart. We see Alysis, we see line six, even down the line, not his direct involvement, but the people who knew him and worked with him. We see this crazy uh, digital world come out of MXR's mastermind. But MXR fell apart and disappeared. They go bankrupt. Roughly, they're non-existent around 84. So for four years, picture a world where MXR doesn't exist. But then Jim Dunlop goes, hey, I'm gonna buy this and relaunch it. And he does, and they do amazing stuff. So Jim Dunlop, like serial collaborator, serial product launcher, amazing dude. All right, next one. In 1993, the most legendary fuzz pedal ever, the fuzz face, is float it's it's floating in in nowhere land it's gone from arbiter to dallas arbiter to crest to like it, it's just all these people have tried to make it they made it in different places and it floats around and there's different versions but the fuzz face in 93 like it's just wild west 
And he says, hey, I'm going to take this in. I'm going to do it right. And they're doing it right. And even today, I love it because like the fuzz faces now and so much of Dunlop's work, it involves these brilliant people that I'll try to list some names later. But, but my favorite, because I consider him a friend, is George Tripps of Way Huge. I mean, people like he's a boutique legend in himself with Way Huge, and he's involved in, you know, the fuzz face with other people. And he, it's just such a beautiful thing that Dunlop has going on over there. So they've relaunched Crybaby, MXR, Fuzz Face, and Way Huge, which I just said in 2008. Um, it, George decides to go to line six. He shuts down way huge, literally to the point where he had a NAM booth purchased and he just doesn't show up. Like he quits doing it all and goes to work for line six. And Jimmy approaches him, I believe, and is like, Hey man, I want to do this. And George is like, no, I believe the story is he kind of keeps approaching him. And eventually George is like, cool, let's do this. So now you have this really important George Tripps in the pedal world and in the boutique, like how pedals have evolved. Like his hand has been in so many things like the DL4 or whatever these fuzz faces. Um, Way Huge is brought back by Jimmy Dunlop and made accessible because if you try to collect an old Way Huge pedal, you're kind of like screwed. If you're on a budget, it's impossible. I don't even have many of them. They're just really hard to find. And now you can go buy them at a guitar center or Sweetwater and they're affordable and they sound amazing. And so Dunlop has this history of this. So that's why this story fascinates me right here. Do they sound good? Yeah, they sound great or they wouldn't be made because the two people are involved. There's always more to it. Like this historical moment is that now on the list of Dunlop's achievements from a collaborative perspective in the guitar world that have made companies more successful, other people that have made builders' ideas get more to the masses, now we have two more amazing things that Dunlop and MXR, being part of that whole thing, have now done. It's, it's brilliant. So why are these great for the guitar world? I'm going to go through a few quick points here. And remember, I'm going to try to fly through this so we can do some Q&A. A bigger audience, number one, a bigger audience can access these. This is important and this is amazing and this is good because a bigger audience can now grab a Timmy and a, like a the Prince, like the King of Tone circuit. They can essentially grab, you know, the Prince of Tone or the King of Tone. They can grab that. These are going to be sold all over. The, they're already sold all over the world. We're talking like, Country like Dunlop MXR, those catalogs, that dealer network, that dis distribution network, we're talking all over the world from the Middle East to England to Africa. Like the accessibility now is they're making tons of these, they're able to make a bunch of these, make them really well, and ship them out through the world. And they're setting in stores. This has never really happened. You see, Paul C making big batches of Timmy's, but it's a few hundred. They go to a couple stores, they sell out, people wait. You get the idea, you have to buy a used one. With the King of Tone, Prince of Tone's fairly accessible, but you still have the same thing where you're ordering them. You can't ever really walk into a dealer. You know, when I managed to shop in Alabama back when I was like 20, that's the kind of store that never had anything cool. But now you could have these because they're in like the Dunlop catalog. And when you go to order strings or tortoise picks, you can order these cool pedals. So that's number one. A bigger audience can access these, number one. Number two, what felt inaccessible is now easy to get. I know that's kind of the same point, but there's a different, there's a different importance there. There's an accessibility to what has felt hard to get. And this is good for everybody. This is good for the artist that's always wanted to try one of these. Maybe the Timmy is the most amazing exact sound somebody's looked for, but they've never been able to access one of the batches that he makes and they just don't end up with it. And maybe this 19 year old, you know, 19 year old girl, she's amazing on guitar. She walks into a shop and it's in like Des Moines, Iowa or somewhere. And she buys this and it changes her guitar game forever. That is amazing. Accessibility is always a plus. 
number three. They are getting paid for these. So they're getting a royalty. This is officially licensed. They're both involved in the product. It's so stinking amazing. The whole thing's amazing. Number four. I like number four a lot. This further signals the end of the old way of doing things. Now, I did the Monday talk on full tone, and it really riled up the gear page. It was very interesting. I actually had fun hanging out in that thread, but the thread went, it was one of the bigger threads I've ever been involved in, but it just struck a nerve because I said, is boutique over? And a lot of people got pissy. A lot of people took that in a way I wasn't intending. What I'm saying is there are eras to how things have worked and history does repeat itself. But this moment is interesting because full tone has now slid away. We will see some form of full tone, I'm convinced, out of Nashville. But now these, the boutique of boutique, are being mass produced. And here's what's amazing. Now we can all settle in and get rid of the stigma that mass produced is bad. The irony to me has always been the hater on the phone. Where's my phone? Doesn't matter. They're on their cell phone and they're like, mass produced sucks. And they're on an iPhone or they're like surface mounts bull crap. And they're literally on a supercomputer with surface mount. That has always been ironic to me. So these two pedals are really helping like, cleanse the palate of ignorance with how how ridiculous people can act about how things have to be made to sound good there's so much silliness in that so it's not that boutique isn't fun this term boutique it's not va- it's not that it's not valuable and it's not that it won't keep going people miss that in my full tone talk i wasn't saying people are going to quit building pedals by hand I'm still going to build stuff at this bench. I'm going to do more 66 series. Tons of amazing friends build small batches, one employee shops. Those are going to get stronger and stronger and be around forever. I wasn't saying that. I was saying that now we have this reset with full tone leaving. And now with these, there's a real reset that says, hey, you can make the Timmy and the King of Tone circuit. And you can make it in a factory. And you can sell it affordably and you can place it all over the world for everyone to access. This is huge. This is huge. Boutique can still go. Analog Man's going to keep making boutique stuff because he's stinking amazing at it. He's going to keep building these amazing pedals. Paul's going to keep building Tim's and Timmy's. He's going to keep shipping them up to Humbucker Music or wherever in Chattanooga. Right? It's cool. All right. So I want to go through some stuff. Um, that has not been really talked about because we see these two. We see the history, um, uh, that back history of MXR, Dunlop, uh, Way Huge, all these companies kind of like Jim Dunlop's work coming in and now we have these. But actually there were several things before these that maybe they got missed by you. So I want to highlight them. This is really a big, like to me, it's a celebration of like, Go Dunlop. Like, this is stinking amazing. Jimmy Dunlop, if you're watching this, amazing work. This is what the industry needs. This is why I have fought to collaborate with people, like doing the Boss collaboration, doing the Robert Keeley collaboration early. Collaboration is key to creativity. It's key to, like, opening up new doors and new ideas. And I think there's this thing where the pedal world, I know when I started, it had this, I don't know the word, is it insular? Like it's this very introspective, like lone ranger approach where like, I'm magical, I'm a wizard and I'm not going to partner with anybody because I'm magic and I'm alone. I'm going to do it all by myself. And I, I'm so glad to see that dissipating because this collaborative stuff is amazing to see companies do things together. It's going to change guitar more and more and more. There's so many good comments. Let me uh, let me not get into them yet. Here are some things you might not know of. So um, custom audio electronics. This is a collaboration that was done, um, MXR. It's, it's, I believe it's the first of these that they did. 
This is Jimmy Dunlop approaching the legend Bob Bradshaw. So Bob Bradshaw built all these rigs for like Van Halen. I remember uh, working a John Mayer rehearsal and like he was wiring up John's rig. It was like 2016 or 17. This dude's amazing. And he has these, he has an amazing wah pedal. And then this pedal as well. And I believe there's a few more, but I just have some general notes here. So this is 2009. Um, they did the MC404 Crybaby. They did the 401 Boost Line Driver. That's this. They did an overdrive. That's right. I have that. The MC402 Overdrive. They did a power supply and a buffer. So this collab was initiated by Jimmy Dunlop, and the lead engineer was Sam McRae, the head of engineering at the time. Um, I actually got a friend there at Dunlop to give me the details on these years. I didn't want to get anything wrong. So that's amazing. Like this is 2009 is where this starts. This story is not new. This is what's so funny to me about forums and chatter. It's like, let's not miss the 30,000 foot view here. This is not really new. This goes back to, it goes back to the eighties really with the acquisition of things like MXR and, but really right here, 2009, we get into this modern collaborative mode. That's all Jimmy Dunlop. He loves this stuff. Um, 2015, I was unaware that these existed. So I feel like I see every, I try to see everything and I, my job, I work at seeing everything, but I miss these. So I'm going to show them to you. Um, there's the MXR, um, let's see here. It's, it's Carlos, Carlo Sorazio. I believe that's how you say his name. If not, I'm sorry, Carlo Sorazio, Italy's premier boutique amp and pedal builder. MXR released the the Torino Overdrive. Now, I got to be honest. I was like, please ship me these. I haven't even played them yet. If you know anything about these, drop them in the comments. I learned about these from putting together this talk for you. So this is the Torino Overdrive. And then there's another one. It's called the Diavolo Overdrive right here. Diavolo, sorry. Yeah, Diavolo Overdrive. This project was started by Jimmy Dunlop. And the lead engineer was Sam McRae again. So I was unaware of these. Check it out. Go look at demos of these. If I was unaware, I'm guessing you were unaware. But this is Italy's premier pedal and ant builder. And this, I'm going to definitely learn about that for you. Um, see what I can dig up later. But does anyone know about those? Yeah, people are already saying they're aware of them. That's cool. All right, then this one is really cool. It's the M85. Uh, by the way, the uh, Torino and Diavolo were 2015. So again, so we went 2009, 2015. Another 2015 collaboration is this. This is the M85 bass distortion with Fuzzerocious. So Ryan is amazing. I remember doing a, um, I did like this thing at CME where it was like a bunch of builders got together and they were at the table next to us. And my wife was with me, which is a rare event. And we just had the best time. Like my wife had the best time with him and the crew that was there. He's a really great designer. I've shown Fuzzerocious stuff on the show, but this is specifically a rat inspired bass. It's a rat bass pedal. So I, it's amazing on guitar. So if you like rats, you might want to go, well, let's sell these out or something. Cause this is super cool. Um, the project was initiated and managed internally by Scott. Scott there is an amazing guy. I've met him a few times. Um, but anyway, the engineer was Sam McRae again. But look at that. So cool. So that's 2015. So 2016, <clears throat> we have, you've maybe heard of Shin's music. This is like a very, very, very boutique thing out of Japan. Um, they did this pedal which is the Shinjuku drive. This is 2016 Shinjuku. Um, it's initiated uh, and project managed by George Tripp. So that's way huge, Line 6 guy, DO4, all that. Um, with the noted amp and pedal designer, uh, Shin Suzuki of Shin's Music. So the Shin's drives, if you've seen them, they'll have like label maker, label maker, label maker on them and really hard to get, super hard to get. But here we go. Look at that. Accessibility comes from these collaborations. So huge shout out to um, 
yeah, just huge shout out to Jimmy Dunlop for doing this. And of course, this was 2020, so it's old news to some of you. But, you know, it's a really cool thing. Um, I do want to say it was uh, overseen by George Trips. So how cool is that, that Paul Cochran's release with MXR, this legendary company owned by Dunlop, is overseen by George, who ran way huge by himself and understands boutique. I love that. I love that this is like the the story is so cool. It's not like a heartless capitalist robot took this from Paul and was like, we are making it. No, it's like George Trips, like started before Full Tone, one of the OGs is like managing this with Paul. And that's how you know it's done right. I just love that. I think it's so stinking awesome. Um, and then you had the pro- project manager was Joey Osik. I believe it's Joey Osik. So this is the new one, 2022. Um, this was brought to the table by George Trips again. So you have George Trips, way huge guy, project managing and overseeing this whole thing. Um, Joey's also involved. So that's like super cool. So the takeaways are, we have to support these as a community. If you've been on the fence about these, get off of the fence and go buy one or both of these because I wanna see more of this stuff happen. I wanna see so many other amazing boutiques, especially in this weird economic swan dive we're doing. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of hard stuff going on for, for smaller pedal makers and for bigger, I mean, I'm having nightmare situations with supply chain and profit margins that suck and all this stuff, trying to keep employees employed. Like the, the thing that's happening here is you're seeing this, this Jimmy Dunlop collaborative spirit. That's what I'll call it. It's what it is. This spirit of collaboration and it's helping everyone. It's helping you, the player, and it's helping all of the builders And when the tide rises, every boat rises. And I've always been of that mentality. I know if you've watched the show, you see that. Like, I love showing other people's stuff. And the thing that's beyond showing is actually collaborating and lifting up the smaller builders or the boutique builders and making a big deal out of their excellent work. So let's jump through some comments here. I got a couple top chats. Um... IFID says, thanks for the Behringer video, Josh. Just got a chorus. That's funny. Rock on. Um, I'm feeling pretty good to have gotten in at three from seeing Pearl Jam. And my ears aren't ringing anymore. By the way, the show was amazing. Um, B-Man Guitar, why not a JHS wah for us older guys who want a smaller wah but still have wide feet? The mini wahs are not wide enough for us flipper-footed folk. I don't know that I'll ever make a wah. I am so sorry. I'm sorry. And we have, I'm going to hit these top chats first. Um, thanks, Dan, for that top chat. Let's see here. Let's just start going through it. Uh, there's so many questions. Uh, clearly, Josh has already made a deal with MXR for the MXR Pink Panther. That'll never happen. MGM shut me down on that one. I got a cease and, uh, it was like a notice. I got a letter one day. It's like, nope. Um, Scott Pickett has a Duke of Tone on order from Sweetwater for 149. Yeah. Why would you not buy this for 149? Let me further, let me further soapbox something. These are these Chinese clones on Amazon. All right. This is so ridiculous. Okay. Circuits whatever you can't really you can't protect a circuit per se but come on like this is bullcrap demon effects prince of sound like the reason i say that is you go buy this for like half the price of this new real one or something or you know whatever maybe it's even cheaper the point is you're not going to get a warranty. You're not supporting a real person that like created the thing. It's crazy that people would just never put your money into this stuff because you, if you saw the number of emails I get from people asking me to repair their cheap, horrible Amazon clone of something that I've made, 
it's crazy. And then, you know, like this, look how blatant that is. Like there's some that are even worse. Like, I just want to say that's another positive of these. Another positive is like, this is the real thing. It's accessible and it's affordable. And that's super cool. So back into the chat. Um, Yeah, Alex Johnson, the Prince of Tone is made in China. It doesn't matter where it's manufactured. I wasn't holding this up and going, China, crap. That's not my attitude here. It's made properly, right? It's made with extreme quality control. It has the MXR brand on it, which means you get customer service support, dealer network, the authentic designer of this signing off on it. These are these are the real thing, and they are made to spec. Every single cheapo clone of a JHS pedal I've gotten a hold of has it's not the right circuit. I've never seen one correct. There's this ridiculous um, Andy Tim and signature pedal clone. And I track down the schematic online and it's just totally wrong. Like someone just went and said, oh, it's like a governor with this, like put a tone thing on it and do this. And it's like, no, that's not what I did at all. That's not even the same EQ on the pedal. So what you're getting, yeah, maybe it is made in China. That's not the point. The point is these guys are getting their due and they're involved in the design that's good. Like in my opinion, that's fantastic. And you get that lower price, you get customer service, customer support. And I think that's great. Um, let's see. The Duke of tone is too small. I've heard that. I've heard that it's too small, you know, whatever I would put it on my board. I have giant feet. Um, let's see here. How about a delay pedal with a wide knob? No, let's, um, but da, 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 da. recently discovered farm pedals out of Maine. They have a great overdrive phaser trim. Boutique is dead. Long live boutique. I love farm pedals. Farm pedals are great doing amazing stuff. Um, let's see here. A lot of people basically saying if MXR approached me, would I do something? I don't know. That's not the point of this episode. Let's see here. What's your favorite Planet of the Apes movie? I've never seen a single Planet of the Apes movie. Check out the Junior Wa. That's a, a recommendation to the Wa comment. All right, Brian Carpenter. Josh, do you think this is a way for Analog Man to plan ahead for possible retirement rather than selling his brand when the time comes? Um, no, I just think he's collaborating with Jimmy Dunlop and George and Mike go way back, like pre-internet. I believe, I believe that they would like even exchange schematics because Mike is on the East coast and he would have all these, like, I believe this story. And I love this story because it's so cool. There's this friendship between George Tripps and, and Mike that goes way back where, if George over in California needed to a schematic for like a small stone or some EH pedal, they would like get a hold of each other and actually do copies of the paper. Cause Mike is on the East coast near EH. And then George had all the Dunlop MXR schematics. So I believe they would do some swapping that might not be completely accurate, but in my mind, that's one of the stories I've heard where they had this friendship I believe George went like, hey, we should do this. The adjacent possible that I talked about, I believe the Timmy is definitely the adjacent possible for the Duke of Tone. If you watched last week, you'll understand that. And so it just keeps kind of escalating and that's really cool. Um, Let's see. Dunlop, will they go after full tone? I would say nah. I I would say no, they probably won't. There's something more to the full tone story, and I don't know what it is, but something's not quite obvious with the full tone story. Um, meaning there's something else to that. I, I don't know. It just seems weird to me. Um, let's see here. Christopher Reese Rice Reese says, would love a Monday talk on the practical impacts of the global supply chain issues on pedal makers. That could be cool. If you'd like to see that, maybe second that in the comments. Um, Let's see here. 
La 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 la. No more pedals. Great name. Says I'm excited to try the Duke of Tone. I completely agree with the accessibility. I've never even thought of trying one out. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Someone said just now. I've never thought about trying out, you know, a Prince of Tone or a King of Tone because they feel inaccessible. Even if they are slightly accessible, there's they feel like they're not. This is good because of that very statement. That's one of the points, and I love that. Um, Shoe Gazelle, Shoe Gazelle, I see what you're doing there. I'm not sure how to say it. Is discrete circuitry considered boutique? No, discrete circuitry just means that all the amplification within a pedal is not, it's not using integrated chipsets, ICs or op amps. It's doing it with transistors. So you have an op amp. You might see the little chip. People obsess over the chips, which is silly. But a chip, it has eight legs. A chip is basically a ton of transistors in this chip making a perfect gain structure. And so discrete does away with the chip and does it manually. Like it does it with all the little transistors and that stuff. That's discrete. Then that saying that's boutique makes no sense. That's like saying, that's like saying that, I don't know what that's like saying. I'm having, my brain's not firing on that cylinder, but it doesn't make any sense to think that that's boutique. So whoever told you that, that's, that's a weird thing for them to tell you. Um, Mad scientist, what is a dealer network? So a dealer network is distribution. Um, When you go to Target and you see Beats headphones or Apple iPhones, Target is a dealer for Apple or Beats, and they're part of a dealer network. Now, the reason that's important in pedals is it breeds, um, number one, it, it, it breeds cells. So it allows the company to scale up. If you're only selling on your website, you're only going to reach what your website reaches, which is very minimal nowadays. Now, if you add social media to that, you've scaled up a little more and you've reached some more people and you might sell a little bit more. Dealer network is the biggest key to having more sales and more profits because you end up getting your product, your Beats or your Apple computer in front of all the people who walk through a Target. That's a dealer network. So in guitar, we have Sweetwaters, we have, you know, Andertons in the UK, we have Warwick, my distributor in, uh, out of Germany. You have, I have a Japanese dis- distributor called KC Group. These are allowing my products, <clears throat> sorry, allowing my products to get into tons of stores in a dealer network. And that's what's happening here. And that's why that's so great. And that's why I said a lot of people who have never seen these designs will now walk in and it's a moment of that's an option. And that's really wonderful. I love that question. Um, two more questions here. I'm going to do two more and we'll get out of here. Um, Aaron Goldberg. Yeah, I had no, I had no idea about a couple of the collabs. He said, I had no idea there were so many of these other collabs. Um, let's jump down to the bottom. Uh, Kyle Thurow, Chase Bliss going direct will be a very interesting interesting experiment with this dealer network system. Yeah, I think for certain people, the dealer network isn't necessarily a good thing. Um, and I think further with this economy that's like sliding down the slope of of whatever black hole it's been headed towards, people just aren't buying like they were. And all of you know this, like, I'll just say you are not buying things like you were. The The numbers do not lie across the entire guitar industry where, you know, fenders clearing things out. People scaled up because everyone was buying astronomical numbers uh, of things. And then now suddenly they're not. Now you're stuck with this inventory and you have to clear it out. There's a situation that's happening where the economics feel like they're bending and breaking a bit. and Direct sales can be a key for certain people in being way healthier in this time. And I think I think that dealer sales are not always the answer. The dealer network is not always the answer. So I think that Chase Bliss, that's a really exciting move he made. And I'm interested to see how it pays off for him. Um, here we go. Derek Mortensen, I literally have 40 guitar pedals. That's why I slowed down. Yeah, that's a point. That is a point. 
All right, last question. Here we go. Hair, uh, I'm looking for a specific, uh, for a question. There's a lot of great comments. Um, let's see here. Uh, oh, this is great. Nathan Lundstrom. Nathan Lundstrom says, seeing the MXR Duke of T Duke and the Timmy collabs happening specifically in the small pedal factor does that pique my interest in miniaturizing jhs pedals on the roster no it doesn't i've done many pedals like but no that doesn't really pique my interest um and thanks thanks for the top chat jason he says thanks for doing these deep bad talks on monday tons of great info appreciate the work that goes into researching them yeah you're most welcome i love doing these this has been really fun Thanks for hanging out with me post Pearl Jam with very little sleep in my weird basement office. Uh, I much appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, the reception to these Monday talks has been really cool. And honestly, they've, you know, they've been really good for me. Um, sustaining a channel for like almost four years, it's it can be quite difficult. Like you get tired of things. Think about things you've done for four years. I've done the channel for four years and it, it can feel like, man, I need a break from this. I want to do something different. And these Monday things, I love it though, by the way, I'm not, I'm not being forced to do the channel, but there is this thing where the Monday talks have been really nice because this element is more what I love. I love what I do on the channel. I love the other aspects. I love the humor. I, there's a, some funny stuff where people are like, Josh looks so sad. I'm like, no, I don't have to tell jokes all the time. That's not, I don't, I'm not that way constantly. That would be exhausting. I mean, I love these deeper talks. I love thinking about the big top down views, the historical significance, why things happen. I love teaching period. So these have been really good and it gives me a chance, you know, I can still go do a crazy episode about pedals and cereal which is, I had that idea for years and years when we finally did it. And it was so fun. But yeah, this is more what I naturally love to do. Um, anyway, thank you. Have a wonderful Monday. Get your week started off right. Go and check out all of these amazing MXR Custom Shop pedals. We have the Timmy. We have the Duke of Tone. These are the newest ones. Go back and look at the custom audio electronic stuff they put out. Um the shin drive you got to check that one out make sure you go check out this bass distortion which is a rat pedal modified for bass ryan is so good at what he does and then we have the amazing italian amp and pedal builder pedals you got the torino and the diavalo um very cool go check them out support this stuff because it's really important that's it. In the comments, let me know what you would like to hear me talk about next week um, or future weeks. If you have any ideas, I'm super into it. And again, thank you for being here. It means a lot to me. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.